We are glad to have with us to the today's uh, seminar, Nikolaos Karnesis. Um, you already see the title of uh, the talk on the screen, Gravitation Gravitational Waves from Space, Stats and Future Prospects. Uh, allow me to uh, give uh, some data from his CV since it's the first time he is speaking in our uh, seminar series. So, uh, he got his uh, diploma from uh, uh, the SEMFE school from the National uh, um, uh, Technical University of Athens. And then uh, he uh, received his PhD uh, degree in Spain, Barcelona, from the Institute, uh, Institute de Estudis uh, Espaciales de Catalunya, if I pronounce it correctly. And then it, uh, there is a series of uh, postdoc positions at ESA, LISA Pathfinder Mission Operation. Um, then he went to Germany in Hanover, Institute für Gravitations Physik der Leibniz Universität. Uh, then uh, France, uh, Laboratoire Astroparticle Cosmology uh, in Paris. And, uh, and recently he has a postdoc position at the Aristotle University of Saloniki uh, here in Greece. Uh, his main uh, scientific interests are in gravitational wave physics, astrophysics, cosmology, and data analysis. And you allow me to add one uh, point more. He is teaching uh, there at the University of Thessaloniki at the postgraduate uh, master's uh, course. Uh, the uh, discipline computational astrophysics. So I already told you about uh, when you see the title of the talk. Nikos, you may start. Well, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, yeah, let me fix a few things here. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always very nice to, uh, to talk about uh, gravitational waves and also to advertise our work a little bit. Um, I hope today that I'll, I'll show you a few things about gravitational waves. Most of the most of the things I guess uh, you've seen before, but it's good to, to start from the beginning always. Uh, right before I start, I also want to apologize in case you hear any noises. I mean, we are uh, at home, and uh, my both my kids are a bit ill because of you know school. I don't think it's COVID, but you know you never know. So let's hope for the best. So like, yeah, apologies for any uh, noises that may happen during the talk. I hope I hope it will be uh, bearable. Right. So uh, let me begin and uh, starting from the very very uh, basics that we uh, from the very very basics. So first the outline of the talk. First, I'll talk a little bit about gravitational waves and how to measure them. What is the principle of measurement of gravitational waves? And then uh, I'll jump to the second part, which is um, what do we expect. Uh, to, to see when we uh, see to switch on our antennas in space concerning gravitational waves and what are, are the differences to, to, the, to the signals that we are, um, that we are uh, recording in, with ground-based detectors. And then uh, the third part is going to focus on the analysis of the future data, of our future data, which is also part of my, uh, of my, of my work. So yeah, uh, uh, I mean, my interest is in cosmology and astrophysics, and, but, but, uh, my, but I mostly focus on data analysis and how to uh, extract all the signs from the data. So, I mean, I, mean, I hope that uh, you'll see what I mean like, when, when we reach that point. Okay, so uh, part one, what are gravitational waves? I think uh, people have already seen uh, the, the past, the, the revolution that has, been, has begun the, the, the last half decade. Uh, the, the gravitational waves are the direct consequence of general relativity, and we can think of them as the electromagnetic analogues, right? When we have uh, accelerating charges and they produce electromagnetic waves, uh, now in, with gravitational waves, we have, instead of accelerating uh, uh, charges, we have uh, accelerating masses. So we have changes in the mass distribution in, in some uh, confined space, and that produces gravitational waves. And uh, what is the main effect? So gravitational waves uh, basically do not doesn't interact very quickly with matter. So we, what happens is that we have uh, the, the space time oscillates between uh, two test particles, and that's as we'll see the, the principle of measuring them. Uh, a bit of uh, relevant information. 
Uh, so the amplitude of gravitational waves though is, is really small. So with those masses, there's changes in mass distribution needs to be very violent. And also it, we need the masses to be, to be like huge. Uh, and uh, for, for that reason, we have, uh, we have gravitational waves being produced by, by uh, oscillating uh, binaries like uh, uh, black hole, uh, black hole uh, binaries or neutron stars and things like this that they produce uh, signals st strong enough to be uh, detected uh, with our detectors. Um, so uh, the, the effect of a passing gravitational wave is, is demonstrated in this cartoon here. And uh, as you can see, if we place uh, some test masses and forming a ring of particle on the ground, then there is a gravitational wave passing perpendicularly to, to the screen. We'll see uh, the, this is exaggerated effect, of course. We'll see the ring of particle, particle oscillating in these two ways. We call this the plus and cross polarization. And that's what we use to measure them. And also it's worth to mention the Hulsen Taylor Pulsar, which uh, gave them the, the Nobel Prize in 1993. And uh, basically what, what they measured uh, with this binary was that uh, the, the loss of energy or the, the shrinkage of the, of the orbit between the, the two objects uh, uh, was according to the theory of, of uh, general relativity, was according to the energy being lost due to the emission of gravitational waves. And you can see the theory with uh, this is a very classic, uh, let's say, image figure here, where the data points are depicted in, 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 in black here, and you have the straight line, which is the theory. So this is, this is all indirect detection, but uh, now, uh, since uh, 2016, 15, we have, we have detected our first gravitational wave, and up to then, uh, the, the future is, is, is open to, to measure even more events. So I, we discussed a little bit the, the principle of measurement. I mean, we, we, we can imagine what uh, we know what the detectors are doing to measure the uh, gravitational waves. This is another cartoon which shows the, uh, how the ground-based detectors like the LIGO, Virgo, or Gagra are, uh, are operating. This is the principle of operation of the detectors. So what we have is nature happening. We have a binary black hole oscillating, and then we have the emission of, of gravitational waves. And what happens is that, uh, we basically put test masses at the end of large arms. So these arms have length of, of kilometers. So in particular, in LIGO, they are four kilometers length, these, these arms. And what we do is we shoot the laser. Then there is a beam splitter here at, at point B. Uh, the laser beams uh, is being split and then are being sent to the test masses, which are mirrors. These are large mirrors that are hanging uh, on, from pendulums to shield them from seismic noise, etc. And then they, the, the light, uh, the, the photons are coming back and they're being recombined in the, in the light detector. So if there is no gravitational wave passing, what we'll see is, uh, is basically zero because the two uh, light waves cancel each other out. But if there is a gravitational wave passing through this apparatus, then the, the, the distance between the test bodies are going to oscillate a bit and then we will uh, measure this uh, oscillation. We measure the light waves not cancelling out. And uh, uh, this was uh, what this was the method that uh, successfully measured the first gravitational waves, and this is what we see here. Uh, here is a, a particular uh, waveform how it looks like. We have time series here and the strain amplitude on the y-axis, and uh, we see also the different phases of of, of an in spiral, so of uh, of this binary um, evolution. So we have the in spiral first in the beginning or the first the two objects uh, oscillate one another, then they, they come closer together because of the, the uh, lose energy due to the emission of gravitational waves. And we have the merger of the objects in the ring down. And uh, uh, you can see the two colors of, of time series here, which uh, represent the data from the two detectors of the two LIGO detectors that are shown here in this map. So uh, we have also the Virgo detector, which is in, in Italy. The GO600, which is in, in, uh, in Hanover, in Germany, which is not detecting, it's not uh, long enough. The arms are not long enough to detect the gravitational waves, but it's testing in technologies. I know about uh, LIGO India, which is approved. I think they, they, they are going to get online in, uh, I, don't know, I don't know when, it's going to delay a little bit. But there is also the CAGRA uh, detector that is being put online. Uh, I think it will be online during uh, the, the new science run, but uh, they have, there, there might be delays. So there is a whole network, a lot, a whole network of uh, gravitational wave detectors that uh, 
uh, they can combine the data and they will enhance, we can enhance the, the, the parameter estimation that we do for these uh, events. So what do we have uh, up to now? So this is uh, what they call the, the stellar graveyard. It's uh, uh, when the two objects uh, uh, merge together, all the events basically uh, are sorted according to, the, to their masses. And you can see, for example, here, two neutron stars uh, 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 oscillating and merging to, to produce another object. So this is a lot of events uh, so far since uh, more than six years now. And for, uh, for, for a short medium science runs, we have really a, a long catalog of events where we can already study uh, and to try to do uh, astronomy or, or cosmology with it. Uh, so, and this is another picture that exactly shows that. So we have the uh, time in days in, in, in science runs, and then we have, we have here in the y-axis the cumulative events. And you can see we have the few events during O1, and uh, a few more during O2, and as we, uh, uh, as the detectors have been more uh, advanced and more uh, um, uh, improved, uh, by with time we, we will get more and more events. Uh, so with O3A and O3B, we have this explosion of new events, and of course we expect this to be even better with the, with a more advanced uh, network of detectors. Uh, that's another example of the catalogs that we have. Maybe I think this, this figure is already updated. I, I actually do not remember uh, from which uh, paper I got it from. Um, but here you will see, uh, we can see the, the, the map of events in the sky. So how well we can localize these events. And you, as you can probably uh, see is that uh, for most of them, uh, the, the sky localization is not great. So there is, there, is a, uh, there is a huge area in the sky where we could have this uh, event, this signal coming from. And uh, with with uh, very short exceptions, and for example, you can see this W uh, GW uh, seventeen zero eight uh, seventeen, which is, if you remember, it was this uh, neutral star neutral star uh, event back in uh, seventeen, where we also had uh, electromagnetic counterpart. And uh, the good the the reason for uh, having such a good localization is that uh, the 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 waveform lasted more. We had more cycles measuring in the in, the, in our detectors, so better, more data to available to analyze and localize the, the event. And uh, on the right side, you see the catalog and how this violin plot shows the, uh, I think these are black hole binaries. Uh, they, they show us uh, how well we can do parameter estimation, how well we can estimate the sources of, the, of this waveform, the parameters of the waveform. Here, for example, we have the primary mass, in solar masses, the, the second mass in solar masses, and uh, you can see the results that we get for all of these events. And uh, the Q is the mass ratio, and the effective spin is, uh, is the, the spin of the objects. It's a, it's a linear combination of the spin of the objects and also the, the luminosity distance. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we, we do pretty well in, in estimating some parameters, but this is always uh, uh, depending on the, on, of course, on, on various parameters of the object, also the orientation of the detectors and uh, the network of, the, of, of detectors that we have available. So how do we analyze the data? Because we have all these uh, time series uh, arriving in our detectors. Uh, what people have been using uh, is uh, uh, matched filtering, uh, which is basically uh, trying to match a template uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the time series that we measure. And also there are other various methods that, that, are, that, are, but that, are, uh, that have been developed through these years of, of the successes of gravitational waves uh, uh, analysis. And, um, but but uh, the, the, the baseline for all the analysis is much filtering, and this is what I'm going to explain here in, in very short, uh, uh, shortly so if we have a measurement which is uh, we can uh, we can say it's, this is d here then we can say that uh, this measurement is equal to the signal that we measured which is this wafer that depends on some parameter vector theta plus the instrumental noise and uh, this is an example a cartoon again of, of some data we have the noise and there is some sinusoidal signal there and uh, if we have a model of this sinusoidal signal evaluated at some uh, parameter uh, vector theta one and then if we subtract the, if we subtract it from the measurement data, then we produce some residuals. So what we do is that what we need to, to see is that these residuals 
are, have statistical properties that are uh, uh, that are equal to the to the noise only of the instrument. This is what we want to see when we do much filtering. And of course, to do that, we do we try we do multiple tries of, of parameters. We try theta one, theta two, theta three, and then we check the residual seed style until we get a parameter vector which is uh, uh, which is suitable for our purposes here, which basically uh, uh, get us to statistical properties of the noise of the instrument, uh, which is the same as the residuals, right? So what, what how we do this basically is we form a, if we assume that the noise is uh, is Gaussian and stationary uh, etc. If we can simplify our lives, we can see that the probability of measuring the noise is uh, is coming from a Gaussian distribution, and this curly brackets is uh, what we call uh, this noise weight weight and inner product of time series A and B, which is no other than the uh, the FFT squared of the time series. Uh, normalized by uh, power spectral density of the noise. This is what the SN is. Then what we do is we form the posterior uh, of the parameters that we want to uh, estimate, which is the, the product of the prior of the parameters times the likelihood that we defined earlier. And then we try to uh, maximize or sample this uh, posterior distribution of the parameters. And this is what is regularly uh, followed during this uh, analysis for gravitational waves. And also in general, I mean, this is a very widespread uh, technique. So for multiple detectors, what we have is that we have uh, an array of measurements and uh, of course, an array of uh, measured noises. So each detector have their own particularities, their own noises. And what we have here is this uh, noise weight and inner product. Now we write it in a matrix form where we S, this S here, I hope you can see my, my pointer moving around, is the uh, cross petal power, uh, power of spectral density of, of all the detectors, which is of course diagonal. This matrix is diagonal if the detectors are far enough and the noises are not correlated. Okay, yeah. So uh, in with ground-based detectors, this quantity is known because we measure the noise. So we are uh, near the detector, so we can go there, we can try to, uh, we plug devices that measure magnetic noises, measure all the uh, fluctuations of the uh, noise fluctuation of the environment. So we more or less uh, know it. So I'm saying almost because there's always things that we don't know and we need to take into account. So this is an example again of the noise budget of one of the uh, uh, detectors of, of, of LIGO. And uh, what we see here with, uh, with black is the sum of all the noises and uh, the measured noise in total is, is shown in, uh, in blue. So, and every, everything else is just uh, the, the, the noise budget of the instrument. So we have uh, uh, seismic noise, Newtonian noise, all the residual gas that is hitting the, uh, the, the, test, the, the test masses, the mirrors, and all these are things that we can measure and also take into account while we, uh, uh, while we are analyzing the data. And having all these instruments, we can also predict uh, noise fluctuations. Like uh, we can we can predict that you know there's going to be some fluctuation at some given frequencies, um, because there was a, a door closing at this point or something like this, and we can correlate all these noises, which is very useful when we analyze the data. So uh, we have these fixed arms because also the arms are attached on the ground, so there's no motion there, and also we we are able to to go there and measure the environmental noises. And this is why we it's the analysis for, for gravitational waves on ground is, is a little bit more straightforward than in space. And we'll see why uh, in a bit. Right, so with this in mind, uh, we go forward to measure gravitational waves in space. And uh, uh, how, we do, how we do that, this is a, uh, 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 the only mission that is okay. This is not the only. There's also the Chinese some few Chinese missions that are aiming to to launch with together with this one. Uh, but this is the laser interferometer space antenna, and it's a, a European space agency led uh, mission. And uh, as you can see, the, the measuring principles are quite similar. We have uh, spacecraft so that shoots laser one another, and they form all these triangles, which we can use to uh, measure the oscillation between the between the spacecrafts and uh, from passing that, that are originating from passing the Tesla waves. And uh, it has a long history because the idea exists since, uh, I think the seventies, but uh, I'm not quite sure, probably, probably in the seventies. Uh, 
but but it it was only very recently after the uh, the the success of measuring gravitational waves and also the success of uh, of 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 the of the precursor mission, the Lisa Pathfinder, which I'll briefly uh, mention, uh, that that uh, pushed the European Space Agency to. Uh, to to go forward to the development of, of, to, to the, with the development of this mission. So, what is LISA? Uh, it's a constellation of three spacecrafts, of course. And uh, within each spacecraft, we have uh, two, a set of two test masses, and those are free floating within uh, spacecraft. So there is nothing; they are not touching anything, and they are enclosed in, in this uh, caging, being shielded by uh, by radiation and all the other environmental noises. And what we do is we shoot laser across 2.5 million kilometers. And, uh, and uh, the, the laser bounces to the to one test mass and then comes back. And then this happens across all spacecrafts and all test masses. And then we recombine the data to create those virtual interferometers like the ones that we have on ground. Um, so it's, the orbit of, of, of LISA is going to be the same. Uh, it's going to be heliocentric. It's going to follow the Earth. Uh, across uh, like uh, almost 20 degrees and uh, it's going to do this kind of bubbly uh, uh, it's going to have this kind of bubbly rotational uh, uh, orbits uh, so this is what, how it's it's being it's being uh, uh, how it's being proposed of course i think yeah i think this is the final design i don't think there's going to be any changes with regard to that so what do we have? As we can imagine, we have arms that are not fixed anymore because things are now, the spacecrafts are in space, so they're not fixed on the ground. And we have a not, uh, constellation which is not rigid. And uh, the direct consequence is that we have an antenna pattern that is evolving. Uh, still, we have in, on ground, we have an antenna pattern which is evolving as well because the Earth is, is rotating and uh, is orbiting the sun, but still, um, the antenna pattern, the, the, the rate of evolution is, is much, is probably larger in LISA. And also because of that, when we shoot lasers and then uh, they, they, and then the, the light beams come back in, we, when we can't, when we combine them, the, the, the waveforms, they, they, they don't cancel each other. So we have to devise an algorithm to do that. And this is a, a field of research by itself. It's called time delay interferometry and it's the art of, of, of artificially delaying the laser beams on the laser time series on ground to, in order to cancel, to cancel the laser noise. And uh, this is how you do it. I mean, if you have rigid arms, what, what you need to do is like the thing we do on the ground, we shoot lasers from one place to the other, and then we combine the, blade, the blue and green uh, beam paths, and then the laser noise cancels. But now in our case, we have to, with Lisa, I mean, we have to uh, shoot laser from one spacecraft to the other, then back to number three spacecraft, and then combine, do this again, and recombine everything on uh, uh, to to make this to create this virtual interferometer. And also, we need to find the distances of these of these spacecrafts to to estimate the delays of, of the photons and uh, do this artificial uh, time delay interferometer thing. So we do this from each spacecraft, and, and we have this. Basically, Lisa is going to be three co-aligned. Uh, detectors one on top of the other and also we have this uh, they call they are called null channels where the response to gravitational waves is are going to be very small and uh, this is useful to estimate the uh, the noise properties of the instrument so if you measure only noise it's always nice to 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 have a baseline but still this will not give us a whole picture so that's another difficulty so this is the what this kind of the chain of uh, of, uh, of events, what, what we will have to do uh, to get the data on ground. We have nature happening, gravitational wave strain. We have the sky response of the instrument. And uh, we have forces and, and force and displacement noise that are acting on the test masses. This we need to measure with various instruments on, on board. The phase readouts of, the, of these uh, beam paths. And also, we also have the readout noise there. We apply the time delay interferometry algorithm. And then we have these uh, X2 variables. These x2 are this x y z. This is a power spectral density of, of the of the noise on the instrument. What we can do with this x y z x and y z are the uh, the correlation between the channels because they are sharing instrument. Of course, there's correlation between these three co-aligned uh, outputs. But what you can do one one can do is can do a noise orthogonalization and go to these a and t variables where 
make the analysis a little bit easier. So uh, as you can imagine, this, this project of putting spacecrafts 2.5 million kilometers away and then shooting lasers on test masses that are free floating inside them is, is a bit of ambitious to say the least. And that's why uh, ESA and NASA uh, decided to go forward with a precursor mission, the one mission that would test uh, technologies for LISA. And this was the LISA Pathfinder. So I'm making a small parenthesis to explain LISA Pathfinder a bit. So LISA Pathfinder was, was, a, uh, was launched in 2015 and it lasted for, less, for almost a year. Uh, for mission operations, and it's a single spacecraft putting test masses uh, facing each other, also free floating. See here is this is the LISA technology package. Uh, this is uh, part of the LISA technology package, the main instrument on board. And what we did is to shoot lasers between those test masses and measure the differential acceleration, basically. And with this, we were able to measure the noise that we will have on this environment, because. If the noise, if the acceleration noise of the test masses was too great, then you would never measure gravitational waves. This, is a, this would be a, limited, a limiting factor. And uh, with this, we built an uh, accurate model of the magnetic noise, electrostatic noise, uh, Brownian noise, noise, and all these uh, environmental uh, uh, noises that were uh, that uh, could be limiting for measuring gravitational waves. And uh, also tested all the technology that was used. So these uh, interferometric uh, bands and lasers and everything that, uh, that would be useful for LISA. And the result was that uh, uh, this is a power spectral density of the acceleration noise for a single test mass. Uh, this is the x-axis frequency. And uh, this red line was the uh, requirement for LISA. And already with Pathfinder, we demonstrated that, uh, that this was already, uh, this was already, it could be reached uh, the, the requirements for Pathfinder were much more relaxed than LISA because, uh, you know, this was testing technologies and we were not sure that, that we would even surpass reach at this point here. But still, this is great news. This was uh, a great success. And uh, uh, this was one of the reasons that we went forward uh, with LISA. So we close this parenthesis. Of course, the, the, the LISA Pathfinder mission was... was uh, um, was really interesting, and uh, I, I consider myself really lucky that I was able to take part on, on during operations. Uh, but uh, you know, there could be a whole seminar uh, dedicated to this mission. But uh, we should go forward and to the more interesting part of LISA, uh, which is also the type of signals, right? Because uh, moving into space and having these long uh, arms, it means that we move into we will measure sources in different in a frequency in, in a different frequency band. And uh, this is the usual picture that uh, uh, that we saw when we uh, when we want to present LISA and what are the capabilities of LISA is that uh, the sensitivity, which is shown in, in in green, and all the types of sources that we will uh, we will see. Of course, there will, there might be surprises, but this is another thing to be, to be to be discovered when LISA flies. And the first thing that captures our, our eye is the, these, these signals here, which are uh, uh, demonstrating uh, examples of uh, massive black hole binaries. And you could see, you can already see that they will be within the LISA band for, uh, for, uh, for days, uh, maybe months. And they will, we will, they will spend a lot of cycles uh, within the band, which means that we will be able to localize them pretty well. And the signal to noise ratio is going to be huge. So, we're talking about uh, signal to noise ratio in the in the range of thousands. So, and, but we might so the, the rate of those objects is a little bit uncertain. We might see a few per year or to uh, to a few I don't know tens per year. It depends on the, the population model that one looks. And the second let's say, let's go to the second uh, black hole binary population, which is these these types of signals here, and these are the. Uh, lighter black hole binaries, the ones that, uh, that uh, ground-based detectors are able to see. So what we will see with LISA is we will see a population of them, and they will be almost monochromatic because they, we will see them at their initial stages of evolution. So the, for the duration of the LISA mission, the, 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 or, the evolution of the orbits of those objects is going to be more or less stable. That's why you'll see all those dots here. But for some of them, we will see them uh, traveling. So the, their orbits are going to change. And then they will, uh, the, the frequency of, of, of their orbits is going to, to be increased. And then they will 
we will see them leaving the LISA band and falling into the uh, into the ground-based detectors band, which means that uh, LISA is going to be also be a kind of uh, early trigger for gravitational wave events uh, for ground-based detectors. So, and then the one of the most important and also abundant sources of LISA is is depicted with this uh, uh, I don't know violet or how to call them lavender uh, points here, and these are the compact galactic binaries that are uh, within our galaxy. Uh, they are mostly a population of void dwarf binaries, and uh, they are going to be almost monochromatic. So uh, with the duration of LISA, uh, we will see almost, uh, I mean, for very few of them, we will see evolution of their orbits and, uh, or their emission frequency. And uh, But the good thing is that good and also troublesome news is that uh, we will see them, we will measure them all. So whatever is there in the galaxy, LISA is going to, to see them. That's why we'll have this, did you see all those points there? Because these are the resolvable ones. So the, uh, there is a, with a population of a few million, like I think there are, there are models that are ranging between like 5 million to uh, 40 million sources in the galaxy. Uh, so, but, but if there is like 30 million of sources, uh, we will be able to disentangle around uh, 30,000 of them. And the rest of them, they will generate a confusion noise because you know the, the signals will be uh, uh, too uh, overlapping one another and too uh, low in amplitude, which uh, generate this, con this confusion noise like, uh, like this usual uh, party problem where you cannot focus on a, sing on a single person uh, talking with one another in a, in, a, in a room full of people. And uh, this, is, this is what this gray shaded area is, is the confusion noise due to the galactic binaries. And of course, we will have this extreme mass ratio in spirals, which is uh, another class of objects is very important because it's uh, binaries that they basically their masses are, are, are vastly different, which means that they will have all these very interesting orbits uh, and all these harmonics that are going to be uh, long lived and also very interesting to measure uh, within the LISA band. So we have we, we discussed a little bit the galactic binaries. Here is a plot of also a few other stochastic signals. So uh, we will measure, we said that we will measure the, the stellar mass black holes that LIGO measures, but we will measure a few of them, but the rest of them, they will generate uh, a stochastic uh, signal, uh, which is also going to be, uh, to be there and we will also measure. And also there will be, there might be a stochastic signal due to supermassive black holes that are sub, sub threshold events. So too low is not to be seen and always happening like a popcorn noise kind of in, in lower frequencies. So together with all the other trains and signals, we will have all these stochastic noises, uh, stochastic noisy signals that we will have to characterize. And also if we want to, to dig to farther to, to search for cosmological signals, something like a, a stochastic uh, gravitational wave signal from cosmological sources, then we will have a lot of work uh, characterizing all those, all those astrophysical ones first. So coming back to this, to this uh, noise weight and in the product, uh, we see that um, noise here, noise in ground-based detectors was mostly known because we measure things, but uh, with LISA, it's not going to be a known, known quantity because of all of the things, all of those things that we that we uh, described earlier. We have all this uh, flexible uh, constellation. We have not fixed arms and also. Uh, we have gravitational wave signals that are on top of everything. So uh, environmental noises and instrumental noises, uh, we might be able to measure a little bit, but uh, the, you know, the presence of stochastic gravitational wave signals is going to uh, make the analysis a little bit uh, difficult. Right. So we have all these, all these noises and we have all these transient signals that as soon as we switch on the instrument, everything is going to be uh, populating the data streams. And uh, we have a breathing constellation. And so how, how do we go and analyze the data is the question. And this is uh, where also our work in, the, in our group is, is being focused. Uh, and what people do is invest in transdimensional algorithm because uh, we want to not only uh, estimate the parameters of a binary system, but also to, uh, to find out the, the number of parameters, the number of, of binary systems that are there in the data. So this is also an unknown. It's not like like, like current ground-based detectors where we have uh, searching for, for single signals in the noise. It's that we will have too many of them, but we will not know the number. 
and uh, people are focusing in uh, in all these Bayesian transdimensional algorithms, but also nowadays uh, machine learning is getting uh, quite popular. And uh, of course, in the future, uh, who knows what we will um, have more. So yeah, this is the uh, this is the uh, a sketch of, of this is a cartoon of what we expect to, to do during operations. We will have new data arriving into ground in I don't know every couple of days, and then what we will have to do is to estimate the noise model, and then go first uh, rotate according to the source type. First estimating the ultra compact binaries in the galaxy. Then after this, we pass residual to search for supermassive black hole binaries. While updating the model, then we search for stellar origin black hole binaries, then these uh, model unmodeled sources, extreme maceration spirals, and then stochastic, possible stochastic signals. And we rotate always uh, having new data and also updating noise model and instrument model. And uh, the, as you can see, the, the parameter space is, is huge. So we are investigating these days uh, what will be necessary in terms of computing power and uh, and algorithms that we'll need to uh, we'll need to use during operations so i mean this is also part of our work but uh, what we do uh, uh, to we people usually invest in stochastic algorithms like marco chin monte carlo uh, usually marco chin monte carlo i think most of the people have been using those those algorithms these days is that uh, when you have a posterior density where you want to explore, you start from a point in the parameter space and then you randomly, based on the proposal distribution, propose another point in the parameter space. And then depending on the value of the posterior on, on, this, on this new proposed point, you de we decide to keep it or discard it based on with probability. And uh, this is how you do consecutive jumps and then until you have uh, a good mapping of the posterior. But when you have... Uh, uh, when you want to you have unknown sources in the data, you have a parameter space which is not uh, being uh, kept uh, stable. So what you want to do is you want to let the algorithm also jump between parameter spaces with, with different dimensionality. And this is uh, how they call the this, uh, excuse me, uh, reversible uh, jump uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, where this type of acceptance rate is, is being is a little bit more uh, more complicated because now we have to, uh, to to keep detail balanced all these uh, um, details to make the algorithm converge and also converge in a statistically correct uh, solution. So I'm, I'm putting the equations here, but I don't think I have time to, to go through them, but just to show we can discuss them later, just to show that there is a little bit more complicated when jumping between uh, uh, different dimensionalities. In our case, what we have is, of course, is not a simple Gaussian or a 2D Gaussian, it's like a number of sources. So we will have 10 or 11 or 15 galactic binaries in the data. And this is what we're trying to answer with these uh, algorithms. And this is an example of this is a video of how this works. I think uh, mu and lambda are the parameters of the Gaussian and Cauchy distributions. So, for example, if we assume that we have noisy data, uh, and we have a couple of Gaussians and uh, a couple of Cauchy distributions here depicted in pink and uh, purple. Then what we do is we let this algorithm progresses, uh, you know, by proposing new points, but also proposing different number of models in the data. And so what we will have in the end is we will have uh, a distribution of the parameters, which is in this case is mu, the mean of the Gaussian and lambda, the positional parameter of the Cauchy, uh, but also the K kappa, let's name it kappa, which is the, the number of models in the data, which is converging to four, if you if you see in this case. So this is just an illustration, but you can imagine having four parameters per uh, per, per, per curve here uh, is, is easy, is much easier than having nine parameters per waveform and having thousands of them in the data. Anyway, uh, so what this is what we have, what we do, in, uh, in our group, we are trying to make, uh, to combine novel ideas in, 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 uh, uh, in sampling in the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms and also combine them with the, with the uh, with GPU acceleration techniques, which vastly improves uh, the, efficiency, the efficiency because this is what is really important in, 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 uh, in, in, in the LISA data because of, of this whole population of, 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 of of sources that we're trying to, to search. 
Uh, we call it Erin because uh, I'm going to explain what. So this was this was taken from the uh, uh, from the mythos Tolkien, and uh, this is why because we're using this tree analogy, we are assuming that the, we we have three trunks which correspond to the model types. For example, the galactic binaries, supermassive black holes, or stellar origin, origin black hole binaries. Then we have branches, which are the individual sources of the source. So, for example, we might have thousands of, uh, of branches for galactic binaries and a few hundreds for uh, stellar origin black hole binaries. And we have leaves, which is the parameter values for each of the of, for each of the branch. And what we do is basically create a forest of of, of this type of. Uh, uh, number of models, and uh, we try to look up for if this matches the data. And uh, uh, so we use all these techniques combined, which is uh, the reversible dump, jump, which is basically uh, we allow it to give us not only the parameter estimates of the sources, but also the, the probable number in the data. And we're using all these techniques, which are uh, very helpful to, to sample the parameter space. So we basically run multiple chains uh, of, of, of multiple Markov chains in different uh, uh, versions of the posterior where, you know, this is, if this is a posterior surface, we try to smoothen it up a little bit uh, to help uh, transition and then the different chains are combined uh, information in order to give, uh, to sample the parameter space in a more efficient way. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hasting here because I think uh, I should leave a little bit of time for questions, but in any case, I would be happy to, to to discuss all these uh, 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 advancements, all these ideas. And uh, I want to mention that this is going to be, of course, uh, released to, for everybody to use, uh, I hope, uh, June. And uh, it's going to be used to, to solve these Lisa data challenges. So we, we have within the community, we generate data. And uh, this, this data is being served as, as playground for the community, uh, where we generate catalogs of sources and then people are trying to analyze the data. And these challenges have increasing difficulty. So we started with a couple of years ago with the first one, and now uh, the second one is being released. So which is, uh, it has the full galaxy and a few massive black hole binaries uh, on top of it. So it's, it has a little bit of increasing difficulty. And I think people are focusing in, in solutions like this to, to solve it. So we will propose this solution. I hope uh, the analysis is still ongoing. I hope that we will finish uh, before summer and present uh, more and more uh, the results of this uh, methodology. And uh, uh, these are examples uh, of, of science that you can do with LISA. For example, we are working of, uh, of the, this is with Mary Georgusi, who was a, a, a bachelor student at the Aristotle University. And now she's, uh, she's doing a master at fourth and Varelia Kolar from the University of, of Birmingham and uh, Mauro Pironi from Imperial College. And what we can do is uh, here, for example, is the LISA sensitivity. And this is the population, the, the confusion noise that you get from compact galactic binaries, depending on the, on the overall mass of the galaxy. So this is something, this level, for example, of the confusion noise could help us probe the overall mass of the galaxy, but also individually measuring all these thousands of sources will give us hints about the uh, the frequency of, of each one of them, the distribution of the frequencies, and uh, all these are distributions here, or the coalescence time, and also the tier mass distribution, which is a really important uh, attributes of the galaxy that you, that you can get. Um, finally, uh, we can also project the LIGO Virgo results to the LISA concerning stellar mass black holes. For example, if we take the population of, 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 uh, of the LIGO Virgo uh, sources, we can try to uh, reconstruct the, the PDF of the masses, and then we can see how this will look like as, in, as a signal to LISA. And this is uh, something that we are working with the whole consortium as, a, as, a, as a something that we, as an official result of the LISA consortium, let's say. And uh, these are preliminary results where we saw, for example, how the signal will look like if the noise is here, uh, in this right panel here, and these are the galactic binaries, and this is an example of, of the stochastic signal from stellar mass black hole binaries. Uh, but uh, I hope this will appear soon in archive. Uh, okay, so there is also other uh, ongoing projects like study calibration effects of the of the mission and how this will affect the uh, the sources that we are going to uh, to detect. And also, with all with all these, 
uh, how we how well we can reach uh, uh, the how 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 well we can dig into the noise of both the instrumental and the gravitational wave stochastic noise to get to uh, some stochastic cosmological signals. But this is something that is also ongoing. Uh, to finish, uh, I'd like to show you also this poster. Last week we had the first Lisa and Greece workshop. Uh, we invited uh, a few people to come from uh, from ESA. So, so we had the Lisa project manager and the Lisa project scientist, Oliver Gering and uh, Martin Geller, uh, to talk to, to to talk about Lisa from the ESA point of view. And also we had Martin Hutchin and Duan Petito from the Lisa consortium, who discussed. Uh, uh, about the structure of the consortium and how one can contribute. We hope that this would be a kind of first step of, of, uh, of getting a community of the gravitational community of Greece together and also adding a little bit of more pressure to having something like a, uh, a constant presence within LISA because uh, you know LISA is going to be a, a flagship mission of the European Space Agency and the, uh, the, advances, the advantages of, of, being, of being present there as, as a, as a as a national combined effort is, I think it's uh, it's pretty, they are numerous and we can discuss them also these, these things later. So I think the mission, the, the, the workshop was pretty successful. Many people joined, I, 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 many, I hope that you also joined as well. So I wasn't able to check all the participants. Um, so it is the first step. We are going to write now a white paper of, of, of stating our capabilities with Lisa our capabilities as a community to contribute to LISA. And with this, we are, we are aiming to go forward to, I don't know, to with the, with the help of the Hellenic Space Center, of course, because uh, we need to organize with under uh, a national um, uh, agency. Uh, and uh, with, with, with their help, I think we are trying to get something done in more uh, in long-term basis, uh, which could, this could be, I don't know, manpower or computing power or, uh, or, a little, or having some laboratory building some flight hardware, which should be also kind of amazing. Anyway, so uh, I'll finish with this, which is Lisa will give us the opportunity to do astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, we have a rich catalog of sources, of different types of sources. Uh, we will have the problem of, uh, of having a signal dominated observatory. And this is part of our work, developing data analysis algorithms for analyzing this data. and. Uh, we have a lot of work to be done because these problems need to be solved, you know, in time. Even if it, Lisa is a decade away, uh, I think there is a lot of things to be uh, to be studied beforehand. So I'll, I'll stop here and uh, I'll take any questions you have. So thank you very much for this interesting talk. It is time for questions. Let me look at the audience first. Is someone who wants to ask something? When, when is Lisa going to be launched? We heard the question when Lisa yeah. is going to be launched. So the, the plan was to be launched uh, in 2035, but uh, I know that um, they, they, are be, they are pushing to, to bring it as early as possible. I don't think they're going to be very successful, but the, the, the nice, uh, there is another, uh, uh, another another um, thing to to bear in mind is that people there are a community of people that are pushing to launch uh, Lisa and have Athena operating at the same time because then it will give us Lisa will detect gravitational waves uh, a few days probably before merger and then we will have time to send triggers to Athena so we'll have two very sensitive instruments uh, looking at the at the same event so we'll have multi message that we can do multi-messenger astronomy, which is going to be, uh, I think, this is a great opportunity. So I think I think they are, uh, we, we have a little bit of time, but probably it's going to happen around then. Yeah. Are the, the data, the raw data, immediately publicly available, or are they uh, just the people that are in the project, in the consortium, right. that can have access? So this is uh, this is an ongoing discussion now that is happening now. I am part of the of the data policy working group of Lisa, and now I mean different agencies are pushing for different things. NASA wants them to be publicly available immediately, and ESA wants to protect uh, the the instrument more because you know Lisa is going to be built mostly in Europe, 
So uh, having a, a protection period for the data uh, is, is, is more desired by the ESA side and also the consortium, but there are pros and cons in each case. And uh, right now there is uh, going to be a debate of, of taking everything, of putting everything down and discussing everything on the table. And I hope by the end of summer, there will be a decision on the, on the final data policy. So there is, no, there is no answer on this. People are discussing it now. So is there, is there a, a specific group of people that work on the pipeline, let's say, of the of the data, or there are several groups that will gonna try to do the best for getting the information out and? Uh... Yeah. So it's it's like I think the situation is going to be like like Virgo. I don't know if you are familiar with it. So what happened in the before days before having real signals? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, they were different groups that they were proposing different solutions to, 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 to searching signals and doing parameter estimation. And as the detector became more and more sensitive and they, and they were expecting to detect signals soon, they all, all these methods, they were gathered around and they were made independent pipelines. And they, were, they, they are the official pipelines of the collaboration and they are running in parallel and you want to have many of them. I see. Yes. Because you need to verify the data, you cannot have only a single data analysis uh, uh, algorithm. You need to cross verify that they give the same thing. And uh, so, the same will happen with Lisa. Right now, there are many people proposing solutions like our solution. Exactly. In so, exactly. And uh, anyone can enter, right? Anyone that enters the consortium can say, hey, I want to work uh, on, this, on this part of the mission, and they can propose a solution. And if the solution is successful, if it's okay and if, you know it produces results in an efficient way and it's not computational costly, then it's going to be adopted at some point. Yeah, which is in the future. I'm, I think like in five years, they will be more solidified in terms of uh, pipelines. Yeah, exactly. This is the point. So the solutions are already already presented. Are already there. They are published or I don't know in journals or. So the people who are in the core, let's say, of, of the project know about the solutions. So uh, they will uh, estimate if there is uh, 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 an optimal solution for what they will get in hand. Or, that's exactly. So th th there is a filter there. That's why I'm asking. Right. Yeah. If, okay. Because the, because there is protection period in lag of data, right? Yeah, so exactly, they have. Exactly. They have they, they released the data, I don't know, it's been, I think it's been a few months now because in the beginning, they were not able to release the data so fast because they were still learning the data. They were, mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they needed to be sure that uh, they are free of data artifacts of glitches or whatever. And uh, they needed to extract all the signs they could get, you know, to, to, to publish it as a consortium, as a collaboration, and then let it out for other people to see. So they, they had the kind of protection period, but now as they learn more the data and they have more easy pipelines and more flexible that they can handle most of the cases, the, the, the data release uh, period is, is getting smaller and smaller because they do the analysis faster as well. Yeah. Okay. So any other question from, yes, please. Technical question. Do you have any idea how they control the positions of the masses in the, inside the spacecraft that are freely floating. If they drift away, how do they bring them back to the... Right. So what we did with Pathfinder, uh, there, are, there are control loops, right? Uh, so this is... Uh, so this, this caging, I hope that you can still see my, my presentation. So there is this uh, uh, caging here of the test mass. So, so the test mass is free floating, but there is electrodes on the sides of the, of the test masses. And what you can do is you can electrostatically control test mass. Now, if you control it along the x-axis, let's say that these are million kilometers away, so this is not Pathfinder, it's LISA, uh, you cannot control uh, along the x-axis. This is your sensitive axis. If you, if you exert electrostatic force on the test mass, you're losing all the signal. This is too noisy. So what, the, what we are planning to do is we'll have controls along the other degrees of freedom. So. We want to control uh, the, the rotation of, this, of the test mass to be aligned. And then, uh, but you want to leave the x-axis free this because this is your sensitive measurement. Of course, there is 
uh, linkage of the source, right? If you, if the, if you have a, a, a surface, which is your electrode, and then you have a tilted surface of your of your test mass, and you exert force using this electrode, you're going to have rotation as well. And you will have this called uh, tilt to length coupling. So you have noise coming from other degrees of freedom of the test mass. So this is uh, this is something else. You know, besides analyzing the LISA data, which is what I, I presented today, you will have to analyze all these uh, degrees of freedom of each of the test masses, right? You have to know all the noises. Which is um, what makes it, Lisa, I think so in, so interesting. So in my opinion, this is a, uh, this is a very interesting part of Lisa. You have to take into account all these small details to make to make the thing work. So the masses are charged electrostatically, and the charge will survive for years. It will not be discharged. Uh, so they accumulate charges. They accumulate charge because of the of uh, of you know of uh, cosmic rays mostly. But what we do in Pathfinder, we were illuminating with UV light and we were discharging like that. Uh, they were proposing having a wire touching the test mass, but this is having a wire is like a hammer in this uh, sensitivity. Because if you look at this, these are fem femtometers per second squared. This is really, really small. This acceleration, which is, you know, I wouldn't think in my life I would see those numbers. And, uh, you know, having a wire touching the test mass is, is, is catastrophic. So yeah, UV light I think is more uh, viable, but I think they are also taking other techniques of discharging the masses. I'm not, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not following this this part these days. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One more. <laughs> more scientific. Uh, your analysis is based on knowledge of the of the waveforms of the signal. So you have to know the waveform and, and can you try alternative waveforms if someone gave you, gave you a, a, a signal that does not accelerate, that decelerates, for example. You have to know the functional form of that to right. run your uh, procedures. I mean, okay, so waveforms are, I mean, you know, we're, the people are running the ground-based detectors for a long time now and they are, have been checking all these things, so they know uh you know they are they are taking different waveforms like if you have a slightly if you are slightly deviating from general relativity you might add four you know add terms there or you, you you try to play with general relativity you can try to test this hypothesis by looking at the data right so you can do that you can definitely do that and you can compare the waveforms you can compare gravity models in a sense right and um uh so what in, with ground-based detectors, they are not there in the level yet where the uh, waveform uncertainty, the systematic of the waveform is important enough um, to dominate. So the noise of the instrument is more dominant. So they do, they do not care for now. They will care in the future. But for Lisa, indeed, it's going to be a problem because we will have... Uh, those huge signals, those huge signal to noise ratio, there will be like waveforms, like this very distinctive waveforms in the data. And uh, having them accurately modeled is going to be crucial. So this is why uh, uh, this another uh, another use of the LISA data, just uh, discriminating between different models. Okay. So if there is anything from the audience here, I don't see any and up so no okay then uh we thank you again <laughs> thank you very much thank you for having me thank you so uh the borussia's militia legal